And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. You're tuned in to Tapped Out. Hosted by Brendan Tobin and Sean Levine. Only on the BetQL Network. What's good with you? Welcome into Tapped Out. We appreciate you checking us out. However you got us on the BetQL Network, on YouTube, on the Odyssey app. That guy there, Brendan Tobin. Me, I'm the sports machine, Sean Levine. And UFC 295, my guy, is in the books. And Alex Pereira with another knockout. What a scary guy that is. And we kind of have heard about him for a while. Now we've seen him for the last couple of years inside the octagon, and he's the real deal. Last Saturday night, it was a second-round knockout of Yuri Prohoshka to take the light heavyweight title. Before we get too far into it, were you cool with it? Early stoppage? What did you see? Hated the stoppage. I thought Hated. it was early. Hated it. Thought it was way early. Um, I definitely, well, I'll give respect. Listen, Pajeda's left hook is one of the most devastating punches in the sport. I mean, as Sean Strickland asked, is he out of sight? That dude is that he, it's a hammer. It's, it's, it's one of the most devastating weapons that the sport has, but, um, you know, the whole, he was elbowing him on the side of the head. a lot Travis Brown back in the day, uh, getting, getting those, uh, those heads, those, you know, those side elbows that I just didn't think Yuri was, uh, in that quite of danger yet i thought that he was still uh thought that he was still fighting i just thought that it, it, they jumped the gun on it did you have a problem with the elbows i mean those were elbows that's what you're supposed to do no i don't know i didn't have a problem with the elbows being like legal or anything like that but okay. i didn't i didn't think that he was out i thought that he was okay i thought he was he's the you know it's a championship fight uh, i i think that he should have been given a little bit more time um so i just thought it was early. i hated the stoppage Okay, so now that that happened and afterwards the call out, he, he Alex Pereira stood in there and called out Israel Adesanya, but almost in a complimentary way because for those that don't know, after his last loss, Izzy almost kind of kind of went into a little bit of a shell, right? Had a little bit of retrospective thinking, if you will, and said he's going to step away for a little while. I don't know if that was more of immediate talk versus what he's actually going to do, and then Pereira kind of said. Hey, man, you were my inspiration to get back into the octagon, and now I want to be yours. I love it, both the call-out and the fight again. I'm all about it. Yeah, I don't hate it. I mean, like, look, there's so much uh, there's so much history there over multiple sports. Hell, Izzy made fun of Bahada's kid uh, the last time around, so it's not like it's not going to have its layers to it. Um, new weight class, always sexy. You know, I think, you know, especially for Izzy, he's done everything there is to do at middleweight. So wouldn't hate it. It's certainly a division that, um, as we've talked about many times in this show is a little bit cursed, a little bit snake bit since the loss of John Jones, um, whether it be injuries or boring fights or whatever, there's just been a lot of stuff. So I do think that having Pajeda there is, is interesting because he, he has, you know, I think, People love him. I think I think that I think that he does have a star quality to him. Um, and I think that, you know, continuing to furnish this longstanding rivalry is not a horrible thing. I mean, right now, especially with Jamal Hill, if Jamal Hill's uh, you know, still out and 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 not there, and I, I'm I'm totally cool with uh, you know, because let's be honest, who wants to see Inc. alive right now? Um who do, you, who do you think would win the Jamal Hill fight versus Alex Pereira? Man, that's a great fight. Uh, I think I saw Jamal Hill would be a slight favorite to open. I think he's like a minus I'm a little 120, something like really? that. Really? I'd be, I'm surprised by that. I, I was going to ask you if you happen to know, because I I would have thought that he would be a dog, and I feel like that's one of those I think would flip. I feel like Jamal by fight night would be a dog, and if he would, I would love uh, putting my money on him, because, yeah, he's very explosive as well. Um, I'm not just saying that because we talked to him while he's getting his hair cut. Yeah, that's your guy. You talked to him while he was getting uh, his wig split. Pereira's putting together a hell of a resume right now. Even if we don't see that Jamal Hill fight for a while, I mean, you talk about the fights that we've seen versus Izzy and the fashion that he finished them. The Yuri Prohoshka fight, that's impressive. You mentioned Sean Strickland. I was kind of like, oh, yeah, he did knock out Sean Strickland. Killed him. This guy's the dude. Yeah, I mean, he he, he is as scary as the guy. And the thing is, you know, this was talked about a lot on the broadcast, but those, you know, he's, he's a vicious kickboxer. What he does with those kicks to the leg are, are devastating. We, you know, we've seen a lot of guys utilize that breaking people down, you know, Justin Gaethje with the calf kick, you know, it's, it's, 
it's such a systematic breakdown of these guys. And then you also add on fact, oh yeah, they have just, you know, absolute dynamite in their fists. So look, I'm not even saying in the, and I don't want to take anything away from him because he might've won that fight. Anyway, he looked like he was on his way to going to win that fight. I just hated the stoppage. What if he was to run it back with Sean Strickland, just top of the head? How do you think that fight would go down? Only because Sean Strickland, it's almost like I see him as a completely different fighter after that night versus Israel Adesanya. And we've always liked Sean Strickland on this show when he came on, and I've always been a fan, and we know that he can win fights and fight a lot. But I kind of look at him now as a guy that would give Pereira trouble. You know, it, it, it's interesting because... He got knocked out at middleweight. So are you saying he like knocked? He yeah, got knocked. he got he got sent to the the shadow realm, as Did they he? say, you know. So if you're telling me it's gonna be a 205, eh, I don't love it for Sean. I don't love it for Sean. I think that he's you know, I think he's already got a bunch of uh, interesting fights at middleweight right now. But um yeah, I I, I don't know. That's a lot, I mean, dude. Sean fought at welterweight. <laughs> like that's a big it's a it's a it's a big ask. Speaking of guys that fight like welterweights, heavyweight champion, interim, Tom Aspinall, first round knockout of Sergey Pavlovich. Is this where I take my victory lap? I was going to say, you? hey, you should add me so I could. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. When we started this show a couple of years ago, I remember telling you that there's this guy that nobody's really talking about, but probably in the next couple of years, he's going to have the belt around his waist and his name is Tom Aspinall. And then he was kind enough to come and join us on the show and he got hurt in between. So dude, Tom Aspinall, not only could beat up anybody right now on planet earth. And he showed it by knocking out one of the scariest humans that I've ever seen. But let me ask you this, who beats him? We've been asking for a while is there going to be a heavyweight champion that can cement himself going forward and defend his title time and time again? Who the hell beats Tom Aspinall? Man, it's a good question. I mean, it look, it is heavyweight, so that margin for error is always a little Touché. bit greater. But, man, he just doesn't look like he's got a weakness. And I got to tell you, the thing that was most impressive, more so than even the knockout, was the fact that he took bombs from Pavlovich early on in the right? fight, ate him. And then just walked through him and, and peppered that temple and, and put him down. And, you know, such a cool story. You know, it, it, the first of all, coming back from the injury so soon. I love the fact that he's just, you know, we have so much bravado in this sport. I love the fact that Tom Aspel was like, yeah, I was scared taking out Pavlovich on 12 days notice. Had a lot of anxiety about it. Didn't know that I could do it. And I just think, who's not going to love this guy? You know, there's, there's just, he's just so relatable, handsome fella, charismatic. Uh, look, I mean, we always talk about the UFC needs stars. I, I mean, there's no reason this guy can't be as big as anybody. Sean O'Malley, uh, you know, John Jones with a little bit of run. Like he's, he's got all the qualities. Great tattoos also. Really? You believe that? I think he's a great fighter. I don't know that he's quite as marketable as some of those other guys now he should be he's british he's good looking he's a heavyweight he's all these things that you said i think he's more of a I, and frankly i don't think he gives a damn about that stuff i think he's one of those guys that just wants to keep fighting i mean what is you know what are the things that separate these things i mean why because i guess sean's a little bit sean about is more of a troll like, yes, sometimes like brash. he talks he more talks rash more talks more trash more on social media Tom Aspinall just wants to go out there, kick your ass, and go away. I guess, but man, he's entertaining as hell. Like I think you know he's been entertained more entertaining than some of Sean's fights have been. I think every one of them is a first, second round finish. Oh, in the cage for sure. He's got the shortest average fight time in the history of the sport. I mean, he gets in there, he finishes his job, he gets out. So if I said, then give me somebody that could beat him, you can pick any human on planet Earth, not named Francis Ngannou, because we're not going to see him in the UFC. Although he is now the number 10 ranked WBC boxer in the world, which is kind of nuts. Uh, anybody? Um, I mean, I'll say obviously he'll put John on the table. John course, could, John could absolutely beat it. But if I was gonna actually look at heavyweight, um, do I really feel like Surreal Gone beats him? No. Do I really feel like Stepe? I'll always give a fighting chance to. He's Stepe. Uh Almeida. But I don't know. I was kind of, you know, ho-hum with that performance against Derek Lewis. It was dominant, but 
He's not he he doesn't have like it feels like the it factor quite that uh that Aspinall does. So Aspinall would knock his ass out the same way he did Sergey Pavlovich. You'd be like, oh, but he's so scary. Oh, so is Pavlovich. Yeah, if you're talking young guys, I guess Almeida's kind of the only guy you, you really I I you could kind of give a shot to, but I don't know, maybe like if Tied to Ivasa caught him with something. Uh, I don't know. Point. I don't that's know, dude. He's going to be our champion for a while. Brendan Tobin, Sports Machine, Sean the Beat, tapped out on the BetQL network. We appreciate you checking us out on YouTube and the Odyssey app as well. All right. That's a young guy. Now let's talk about some old guys, old gals in this case. Jessica Andrade knocks out Mackenzie Dern in the second round. Knockouts all up and down the card. UFC 295. I'm not that surprised in hindsight. It's like, yeah, Mackenzie's great once the fight gets to the ground, but Andrade, just even when she made the walk, looked so strong. Andrade by second round knockout. What say you? I mean, it was uh, it, it was tough to watch with Mackenzie because it was like, you know, so so many times you watch a, a fight broadcast and I, a lot of times I'll scoff it. I'll be like, all right, these guys have picked their narrative. They're they're overdoing it a little bit. But Joe, to credit to Joe and D- DC, like they were like, Pfft knockouts coming and they nailed it. I mean, it was, you know, McKenzie got knocked down a ton of times in that fight. Um, tough to see. Cause I, I really felt like with McKenzie Dern, um, I felt like she was turning a bit of a corner. I felt like she was, uh, you know, shoring up some of that stuff. And so this is a, a, I think a tough one for her to swallow. I know that her and Jessica both going through some personal stuff in the lead to this. And then for Andrage, like, what can you say about him? She's a gangster. You know, she's been there in every weight class. She's a former champion, uh, backs down from nobody. And for her, the credit goes to, you know, she was probably, if she loses this fight, then all of a sudden she's the gatekeeper, you know, a lot of, a lot Derek Lewis, you know, like, yeah. Oh, we're going to keep throwing the young lines at her. And, you know, for her to stand her ground and have a performance like that was, was super impressive. And, um, you know, I think, you know, kind of revitalizes the career a little bit because I felt like my Mackenzie Dern's stock was very high coming into this fight. That's the thing is, I don't want to oversimplify it, but looking back, Mackenzie was just a little overrated and Jessica was a little underrated. That's all. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, and, and the odds reflected that, like the value was there in, in Andrage. You uh, you took her. I didn't. I thought that uh, Dern was uh, was on the was on the path. And uh, Jessica Andrade made me look like a dum dum because she well, was she was fantastic. If we're talking about you being a dum dum and me hitting bets, I told you Andrade was going to win. I told you Aspinall was going to win, and that he was going to knock him out. He was going to knock him out early. I told you Pereira was going to win and probably knock him. Out. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. And then I remember bringing up the name Diego Lopez, and I said I agree with you. I think Pat Sabatini wins the fight, but Diego Lopez is violent, and he might just knock him out. And damn it, he did. And I should have stuck with my gut. I apologize for talking. Listen, it was a rough night for me. It was a rough night for me. We all have them, boys, boys and girls. We have rough nights at the office, and that was one for old Tobes this weekend. It was, uh, it was, it was a, it was a rough one. Don't even sweat it, dude. We're a team. I got your back. You give us losers, I give us winners, and we still come out on top. That's Brendan Tobin. I'm the sports machine, Sean Levine. Let's just polish off the rest of the main card. Uh, speaking of knockouts, Matt Frivola got knocked Oof. out by Benoit St. Denis. Brutal, brutal, brutal head kick. Uh, you know, picturesque, really, really great. Um, and for Benoit, like, look, man, he gets uh, the, uh like, we, I, I said going to that one, I was like, man, Frivola's that's another that was what I was like, come on, look at the look at the value on this. Frivola's been killing it, and Benoit had other plans. He said, no, head kick upside the head. Night, night. Yes, I would say he uh, got steamrolled that night. Matt Fravola, Jared Gordon knocked out Mark O. Madsen. That would surprise me. Jared Gordon's kind of good, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, and, and you know what? Maybe we should. Maybe Patty Pimler should be like, yeah, you know, kind of is. But you know, we maybe you guys shouldn't be so hard on me for getting getting a squeaker against them. You know, we're all just like, yeah, but you didn't win that decision. You know, you did it. It's like, yeah, but he's good. Ah, we don't care. <laughs> We don't care. Sometimes these things have to play out, though. Like, at first, it was like, what? Who's this guy? Jared Gordon, why is he fighting him? And then it's close decision, and we all boom and don't like Patty Pimblett. And now that Jared Gordon keeps winning fights, you're right. He's pretty good. Speaking of winning fights, before we get out of here, Luby Godinez took out uh, Tabitha Ricci on Saturday night by split decision. Did you agree with that one? Yeah, I didn't have a problem with it. I didn't, Did you? Did you? 
Well, I had my money on. I had. I always put a little money down on Loopy, so I was cool with that one. It was, <laughs> it, was, it, 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 it was. It was a little dicey. Fortunately, though, on that main card, not a lot went to the judges. Very entertaining night at UFC 295. And if you like the knockout BT, that was your night. Because what did we get on that main card? One, two, three, four, five of them. Yeah, it was. It was an awesome night, dude. It was a lot of. Uh, it, it was a lot of entertaining endings. Um, thrilling night for the young guys. You know, it, it definitely stinks that we didn't end up getting the goat battle, but I thought everybody on that card showed out and, uh, everybody there got a great show. And maybe we still at some point get the steep in John Jones fight that we missed out on coming up next. Lots of news breaking inside the UFC and the boxing ring. We break it down next right here on tapped out. Brendan Tobin, Jake Novaker, Sports Machine, Sean Levine coming up next. We put a bow on this bad boy. We appreciate you checking us out right here on Tapped Out. And Sean Levine on the BetQL Network. And welcome back into Tapped Out on the BetQL Network YouTube Odyssey. However you got us, we got you back. That's BT on the sports machine. Lots of fight announcements. Let's get into it. Jan Blahovich and Alexander Rockage. The rematch on January 20th taking place at UFC 297. Your early lean. Man, tough one. I like both of these guys. Jan, of course, uh... So established rocket, you know, rocket is kind of the sleeper. It feels like a lot in this division. We talk about all these guys and he's always kind of been on the outskirts, a little bit of adversity here and there. I'm going to go rocket. I'm going to go rocket. And, uh, you know, I know my boy, uh, Goran Dragic down here, big fan of rocket. So I have a little bit of bias there, but I, I like rocket in this one. Ah, the old Dragic rocket connection that's going down January 20th at UFC 297. And then we also get another, I guess you'd call it a rematch. Magomed Ankalaev versus Johnny Walker. That's taking place at UFC Vegas 83. That'll be your first main event of 2024. Did we see enough the first time around for you to get an early lean? I, I It's it's one of these ones that I, I still feel like I felt in that one. Like I'm going to go with Ankalaev, and I, I do agree with our boy, uh, with our – with um, Big Marcel, who's like, you know, I feel like Ankle Live's a little bit disrespected. You know, it's been it's just been tough. Like, it, you know, he in all of the big fights, they just haven't been that exciting, they haven't been memorable. Everybody agrees he has all of the talents to be champion. I think that if he does something thrilling, could definitely throw his hat in the ring to be right in there with uh, Alex Pajeda. Um, but he needs to do it. And then you have this whole thing that happened with with Johnny Walker and the day. First of all, like, let's get a doctor who asks less complex questions and we could just forthright, like go through this and, you know, be okay there. But, uh, I think my, I'm still sticking with uncle live in that one. What about you? 
Sir, what is the capital of Delaware and what are the last five digits of my social security? Like, what are we doing? Uh, I think Johnny Walker, you probably get some underdog money on him. So I, 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 I've had Johnny Walker that night. I got my money back at Bet MGM, so I'll lay it down again. What the hell on Johnny Walker at UFC Vegas 83, first main event of UFC 2024. All right, former champion Aljamain Sterling says he's gotten a fight offer versus Calvin Cater. I love the fight. I think it's a great matchup. I don't love the fight for Aljo. We say all the time, styles make fights. Calvin Cater, we know, can throw punches and bunches. He would be the highest ranked possible opponent for Aljo. I think Aljo will lose that fight. I think you're saying that a little bit because you love Calvin Cater. I do. Special place in our heart on this show. Almost got Seven it. Seven uh, F bombs. Seven almost, F bombs. Almost got a shut down on show number two. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I love him too. I mean, you know, who doesn't who doesn't like watching uh watching Calvin Cater fight? I mean, he's he's absolutely entertaining. Um you know, with Aljo, it's such an interesting thing because he is, I mean, he is coming off of a knockout loss to Sean O'Malley. Now you're going up in weight and you're wondering like, all right, can he take those punches um, with uh, with the same, with the same, you know, ferocity that he did. I will say with Calvin, he hasn't been losing, you know, he lost on a knee injury. And that was, that was poor luck to him against the Arnold Allen and the Arnold Allen fight. And the Emmett fight was super close, really, really close. Um, I still think I'm going to go Aljo just because of his versatility. I think he's been waiting for this jump for a while, but I definitely am with you that I think Calvin is game. Would you say Cater is single-handedly the reason we no longer do live fighter interviews and those are always taped from now on? He's like solely the reason why, right? He's part of the reason. I mean, getting guys on a Saturday, the thing that's that's awesome about him is he came on live on a Saturday night. That's not very common. Usually it's hard to get guys on a Saturday night. Usually we, as you guys know, we get guys on fight night. He came on the week before his fight and did it on a Saturday night. He's a real one. But uh, really? yeah, it's, def- look, it's definitely a big reason. I I mean, I, I you know, the, the we know the guys, you know, Calvin Cater, Masvidal, you know, Sean Strickland. We know the guys we should never have on live. They, uh, name I haven't name I haven't heard in a while. Dominic Reyes, UFC 297. That's coming up January 20th versus Carlos Olberg. What do you think about Dominic Reyes? Because at one point, I mean, we were talking about this guy might be a top five fighter on planet Earth. This guy might have beat John Jones. And now I see his name versus Carlos Olberg, and I kind of go, eh. Yeah, it, it, it's been it's been a tough go because it's not just that he's lost all his fights since John Jones, but he's gotten killed by everybody he's been in there with. You know, he's he's been finished by everybody since the John Jones fight. So it's tough to be the guy like that's what you're known for. Like, oh, you were that you almost beat John Jones. You maybe did beat John Jones, and you know, I, I'm sure he wants that moment to be past him. I'm sure he wants to be known for something else. And it's just been, it's been a tough go for him. Yes. No, real quick. Did he beat John Jones? Just a yes or no. No, no, I agree. He did. He did not beat John Jones that night. It was close, but he did not beat John. A uh, song. Yudong versus Chris Gutierrez at UFC Shanghai coming up on December 9th. Is song a future champion or is he just kind of that next level of fighter? No, I think he's good enough, dude. I I, I do. Um, I think, by the way, that card's getting moved. I think the, the Shanghai card actually is getting moved yes, back to Vegas. Did. I appreciate that. It did um, literally just on Wednesday night, Wednesday mm-hmm. afternoon, got moved back to Vegas. But uh, no, I think Sean, look, I, I mean, it's, it's, I think everybody in that division is really, really good. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting thing with, uh, with the uh with the reign of Sean O'Malley because it just feels like there's just so many killers time and time and time again just keep coming and I think that song Yudong is right there like I think he is definitely capable of getting to the top and it feels like a lot of guys uh, have that potential at 135. Let's go across the pond where the lads, as they say, are running their mouths a little bit. Patty Pimwood says Leon knocked out Ian Gary way back in the day while training in England. We know Leon is a champion. Who's more likely to have the belt one day, Ian Gary or Patty Pimwood? 
Um, I'm going to go with Ian Gary. I think that Ian has a lot of those qualities. I think he is very good. That is an interesting rumor that has been uh, going around because apparently, I, I don't know, like Ian Gary's like, I guess, getting kicked out of a bunch of gyms and then supposedly got, yeah, head kicked by Leon Edwards and had to go to the hospital. So he's not there anymore. I can't that, get a read on Ian Gary. Can you? Yeah. Then Leon, I think, denied it. But I don't know that those are always interesting. Like, I love the gym fodder that does seem because like, look, these gyms, pe- people see you, you know, you're, you're not just training. Sometimes you're not always training with like just uh, exclusively champions. Like you'll have guys who are on the up and up and someone's going to run their mouth. You know, not surprising. This one was Patty Pimblett because Patty Pimblett likes to talk. Um, I think he is good. The one thing that I think is a little weird with Ian though, is like, he came up kind of as like the nice guy, right? It's like his, he came up as like the a lot like Tom Aspinall, you know, kind of like this uh, chummy. Uh, yeah, yes, he was Irish, but he had all the skills. And then like he definitely tried to get his McGregor on the last time around. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying it's wrong. It probably does make as you you know probably makes you more money, but. Um, I don't know, mate, but what it, it, there is a little thing with authenticity, you know, sometimes carrying that character can uh can be almost exhausting and, and deter you as a fighter. Or you could be Colby Covington and almost feel forced to. I wonder if Ian Gary was like, if I do want to take it to the next level, I can't just be a really good fighter. I have to be really good on the microphone. I might as well use this accent that I have. Again, I can't I just can't put my finger on that guy. I think I like Ian Gary. Um, speaking of smack talkers, Mike Perry and Eddie Alvarez, did you see this face off where they actually threw body shots at each other? It was great. I mean, it's typical BKFC, man. I mean, they they they, uh, they love that stuff. They love shenanigans. They love uh, they love melees. It's not even a BKFC press conference if there's not a melee. Um, it's exactly what they asked for. It's a fun fight. Um, I think that you know Mike Perry, I think, is made for that sport. But if anybody's gonna do well, I mean, like, listen, the underground king, Eddie Alvarez. He, uh, he, I think, can make some noise. We've seen those those rough and tumble guys. Chad Mendez was able to come in and make a splash right away. I think it's an exciting matchup. Certain guys do certain things in their life at the right time, and it just feels like Eddie Alvarez and Mike Perry at this point in their careers are both bare-knuckle fighters. Like That's what they should be. They should still be fighting, and they should be doing it bare-knuckle. All right, before we get out of here, speaking of spectacles, Dana White says for 2024 Mexican Independence Day, he's trying to get the fights inside the MSG sphere. Dude, that is the coolest building right now on planet Earth. My buddy just got back from seeing one of those U2 shows, and he said that inside the building is even doper than outside the building. I think that that could be a big coup for the UFC because if you think about it, instead of ever having fights at the apex going forward, that was a COVID thing. Let's get rid of that and let's keep every single fight, not every fight, but let's keep the the main hub of UFC fighting in Las Vegas and use T-Mobile and use the sphere. That'd be phenomenal. All right. I got to ask about this sphere because I was talking with friends about this. I'm a pseudo expert. What do you want to know? What the hell is it? Like, I don't understand because I saw some videos because I was talking about this and like some some people on social media sent me some videos. I mean, it looks like a glorified IMAX theater. Like we have these things. We've had these things forever. It looks like a like, you know, you get to the cool projections on the screens. But like, what makes it so great? Like, why would I want to see a fight there? I think that's a fair description, a glorified IMAX, but it's much bigger with much higher resolution. And also, I think what adds to it is the outside of the sphere i mean you've seen all the different yeah no i've seen i remember like i remember summer league like it turned into a basketball and it turns into earth and cool but why do i want to watch a fight there like i don't understand i don't mean to be a hater but i'm like i'm I'm like i saw some videos of like a shark swimming above it i'm like dude i went to the museum of discovery in 1998 they had this technology what's so great about this sphere i don't get it i'm sorry unbelievable i remember my best friend and i met up in new york one time in high school and we get to the empire state building he looks up and he goes it's not that tall <laughs> what are you talking about dude the sphere is the dopest building but on planet why? earth okay get fights there but why would i want to do a fight there like what are they going to turn is like are they going to turn it into like the roman coliseum cool all right great i'm this so is- glad we did the fight here so much better than t-mobile 
We cannot please him for anything. That's Brendan Tobin. I'm the sports machine, Sean Levine. Coming up next, we put a bow on this thing, and we try to put a smile on his face. What a Grinch. We appreciate you checking us out right here. It's Tapped Out. Step into the cage with Brendan Tobin in Are You Gonna Fight Me? I'm gonna fight your ass! Here on Tapped Out. That's right, fight me like a man! Only on the BetQL Network. You know the rules. I want a good, clean fight. When I tell you to break, I want you to step back up my command and break. Now go back to the corner and come out fighting at the bell. Hey, welcome back into Tapped Out. We appreciate you checking us out. That's Brendan Tobin. I'm the sports machine, Sean Levine. Friends, Turn foes in, you're going to fight me. Here we go, BT. After seeing Tom Aspinall look so good against Sergey Pavlovich on Saturday night, knocked him out in the first round, you're going to fight me if I say he would do the same thing that John Jones. Man. Look, I don't want to doubt Tom Aspinall because he is amazing. He has been so few guys can live up to the hype. It's such a hard thing to do in this sport. But we're talking about John Jones, baby. I mean, like, I've ne- we've never seen him knocked out like that. I get it. It's heavyweight. But, you know, as much as I was talking to Pavlovich, you know, he's a he's he's a slugger. He's going to go in there. I just think John, he's too lanky. He's too smart. He's too good to get beat like that. I'm not even saying Tom Aspinall can't win. I just can't imagine first round obliteration. No, I don't think he's going to do that. What do you think the odds would look like, just out of curiosity? Because we haven't seen John Jones as a heavyweight that often. Every time we've seen Tom Aspinall, he's looked great. He's clearly 100% back from his injury. I mean, if they actually did get into Octagon, let's call it six months from now, I think it's a pick em fight. I know that sounds crazy. I know that's nuts. We're talking about the greatest of all time versus a guy that just got here in five minutes ago. But at some point, PT, their kind of career trajectories are going to cross and I feel like we're there because I feel like a lot of people would put money on Tom Aspinall. I think that people realize what we do, that he he is the guy. I think that, you know, John's just got one of those names that is going to, you know, hold strong as far as odds are concerned. I don't think it would be lopsided. Like, I think there would be better odds than Stipe because Aspinall is going to be looked more in his prime. If I had to guess, I would say, like, Aspinall is going to be, like, plus 150 
And then maybe like people would say, oh, I get John Jones at a, at a pretty reasonable number. And then maybe I could maybe you could see it fatten up to like plus 200 by the time, because I feel like more money is going to come in on John the closer the fight gets because it's John. Um, but I, I do think that, that, you know, Aspinall will still be a dog just because goat recognition, you're still taking on John Jones. He's never been beat. Um, and I don't necessarily know if that's the wrong decision. Cause I think John probably should be favored. I mean, this is a guy who is, uh, is the best to ever do it, but yeah, there's a lot of questions. I mean, he's never had this many questions because it's a new weight class that we've only seen him with one fight age. And then obviously coming off a devastating injury, um, so there's plenty of reasons I think to back Tom Aspinall. It's it's probably as vulnerable as you could think a John Jones would be going into a fight. We'll never see that fight though, right? We agree with that. I don't think so. I mean, you know, with with Dana coming out and saying like they still want to go with the goat matchup, they still want to do the Stipe fight. Um, and I don't know. Like it, it it's a question of for John, like how much does he want that? Because you know. A lot of times people will say, well, what do I get out of that? And they'll say that's a that's a, a cop out for ducking. And you're probably not wrong. But I do think that John's kind of in an area where it's like, well, what does he get out of beating Tom Aspinall? Whereas Tom Aspinall has everything to gain in that fight where it's like if John Jones beats Stipe, I still think that's a fight that holds more weight on his legacy than beating Tom Aspinall does. Now people might say, so what's next for Sergey Pavlovich? Because you boys were saying he's the scariest guy in the UFC, and now he just got knocked out in round one. I got the fight for him. You're going to fight me if I say it's pretty obvious. Surreal gone versus Sergey Pavlovich. Let's see who the real heavyweight is. No, nah, I love it. I think that's a great fight. I, I wouldn't mind seeing uh, seeing Pavlovich up against Surreal gone. I think that's a fun matchup. It's, you know, rankings wise pretty appropriate and uh and it's a fresh matchup so no nah, i'd be i'd be very much into that fight and i think it's a good i think it's a good matchup you know you have the 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 slugger surreal's uh you know look good in his last one so he can uh kind of keep redeeming himself and take out the big boogeyman um even though he just got beat you know there's still gonna be a weight of scariness to beating a sergey pavlovich it would certainly be a barometer test for both of them. Speaking of coming up at UFC 296, Patty Pimblett steps into the octagon for the first time in a while versus Tony Ferguson. You're going to fight me if I say we're still not going to know anything about Patty Pimblett after that fight. Yeah, I think he described it this week. I don't fight you on that. Uh, he described it this week because he thinks it's it's kind of a lose lose for him for sure. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with that because Tony is, you know, he's, he's washed. I mean, like that's, that's, he just training with David Goggins this week. I, mean, I don't know, you know, it kind of reminds you of like when Conor McGregor brought out like the movement coach, it's just you're like, you're going to these weird, uh, realms. So you're going to go work out with a, a, a badass <laughs> in David Goggins. I don't know what it does for his fighting, but I guess it'll make a, a weird buzz for the whole thing. I don't think Joshua Fabia is going to get a phone call anytime soon. But, yeah, it does feel a little bit like a sitcom when they add a kid to the family. It's like this thing's pretty much done. Once they bring in the Brady Bunch cousin or uh, what was the name of the the, the new kid on uh, Fresh Prince? Nikki. Remember when they brought in baby Nikki? It was like, all right, this, thing's pretty, it's gone this, too far. this thing's pretty much done. Um, Although I am curious to see how that fight goes down because, like Patty said, not a whole lot for him to gain. I just wonder if. Tony retires after the fight. If Patty is still popular, if people boo him no matter what, because he's fighting Tony Ferguson, just I wonder what that fight looks like. I, look, I think for Patty, the best way to go about it is look, you're the young lion, go beat him. If, even if it's a thrilling fight, I don't think that's going to look bad upon him if he has it. Tony is, we, we've said this, like, Tony's not getting washed white, you know, whitewashed in these fights like he was in the start of his losing streak. Like, he's having his moments. But he just can't finish, and he is very chinny. So I think for Patty, you know, the case is, look, if you have a good back and forth, but he wins, he's respectful. I think that's just going to get a lot of people's uh, the bad taste out of the whole Flash Gordon thing that he had go around. I think that that that's the big case, and that's the big win for him here is remind people why they're, they're big fans of you. Yeah, Michael uh, Chandler agrees. Tony Ferguson is very chinny these days. That's for sure. Uh, you're going to fight me if I say I think there's a chance that Nate Diaz is backed by UFC 300 and even fights on that card. Hell, let me throw this in there. Maybe even fights Conor McGregor on that card. You're going to fight me on any of that? 
I'm going to fight you on the Connor thing. I, I think that it's it still, it still smells like Connor and Chandler are going to okay. fight, but I, I agree with the Nate fighting on 300. Cause I think that makes a lot of sense. You have him on there and then naturally him and Connor are in a fight week all together. Right. And as long as Connor doesn't get, you know, cold cocked and, and, and flatlined, well, then that heat's there. You know, Nate's going to have his build up. He's going to get the crowd riled up if he wins and, and says his thing. You know, I think that, the, you know, UFC should book him in a pretty favorable matchup. So you can get to that result. But it feels like having them both there is good enough to to lead up to, I don't know, something at MSG later on in the year or, uh, hell, bring it down to Miami, baby. You, you didn't say you're coming back here. You know, like Dana, you did, did a good game, baby. So, like, I'm all for it. We'll welcome them both down here. You kind of just blew my mind when you said that. Not the Miami thing. You always want the fights there, but Very you're great. right. If they can just get Nate on that card with Connor and then get them at the same press conference, even not fighting against each other, that's just about as good as you could possibly get. And then you still have the chance of them fighting going forward. So I do think that in the next, say, month, month and a half, we're going to have a much better idea of what that UFC 300 card looks like, especially because we talked about this last show. We now know every single main event leading up to UFC 300. Speaking of main events, Francis Ngannou and Tyson Fury didn't go down like any of us thought. As a matter of fact, I've rewatched it a handful of times, and every time I think that Ngannou beats him worse. Uh, you're going to fight me if I say in a rematch? I think that thing would do even bigger numbers, huge numbers. I think it will. I don't think it did that big of numbers uh, the first time around. So I do think for sure the rematch will definitely uh, do bigger numbers. I think that uh, I think that, look, you're going to have a, a fr- people are going to think that he has a chance to win, you know. So, yeah, obviously that's 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 going to hold a whole ton of weight. Um, and for Tyson Fury, look, he's got the Usyk thing. I don't I think he beats Usyk, you know, I think he beats Usyk. <laughs> I mean, it's a little questionable after what I just saw. I think he beats Usyk, but if he beats Usyk, then yeah, I don't know what else he does. I mean, maybe he retires as undisputed champion, or uh, you know, it's going to be one last monster payday. And I think Tyson Fury will probably train a little harder. Like he can say he trained hard for that fight. I don't know, dude. He came in very, very heavy. The scale said otherwise for this one. Um. But look, the the whatever he gets in there, even if he trains more, that man fought timid as soon as he hit the canvas. Ooh. There's there's no doubt about that. He did not want any peace about it. I uh was talking to Andre Ward this week. He, he joined uh my local show down here in Miami, and Andre's like, yeah, like I saw we saw a, a Tyson Fury who didn't want to engage, who didn't want to do it, like we thought he was. He's like, I was shocked. I've never been. He's like, I've never been that wrong about a combat sport event. I'm usually, if I'm not right, I'm usually close to right. And even the boxing you're talking about a hall of famer is like stunned by what they saw from Francis. Why do you think that was? Because it's not like it was the first time that Tyson Fury had been put down on the mat. In fact, I think it was the seventh time in his career that he had been knocked down. But every other time, the truth is afterwards, it almost like it, it rattled him back into wherever he needed to be. Think about how much better he looked after getting knocked down either time versus Deontay Wilder. He looked like a madman afterwards, like he just pissed him off. He looked t- he looked like he got hit by a truck and didn't want to stand in the street again. You know, it's an interesting thing because I've always wondered, like, who hits harder, Deontay Wilder or Francis? And I know right? Francis has has the uh, the record, but look, Francis is bigger than – he's bigger than – Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder fought Tyson Fury at 215. You know, like it's it, it, Francis is a monster. He's a Mack truck. Um, hell, you hear how Stipe talked after how, like how the way Stipe speaks like after he fought Francis. Like Francis hits different. He does. It's it's a it's a different realm, I think. And um, you know, I I don't know, man. Maybe he maybe he's not going to be so keen on taking that fight again, but. If he, you know, boxers do like money and then that certainly would be, I think his biggest object. Cause I do think, I think you're right. I think it would do uh pretty big numbers. What kind of odds do you have to get to bet on Usyk? Because it sounds like I just have to twist your arm and I get it. He's Tyson Fury and we've seen enough out of him to say, all right, he's going to have a bad night at some point. It's just, he had a bad night against Francis and Ghana when he was a 14 to one favorite bet MGM. That's why everybody's so surprised. So I don't know what type of a number you have to get on Usyk, but I saw what kind of shape he's in, literally, just before this show. 
He looks Jack, man, pretty close to a six pack. I saw Tyson Fury. He looked like my uncle Stewart, and that is not a compliment. I think I might lay down a little bread on Usyk. The thing with Usyk that uh, he's he's plus two hundred right now, and I think the thing with Usyk that you just gotta wonder is he's not a knockout artist. You know, Usyk was the cruiserweight lineal champion. He then won the majority of the belts, beating Anthony Joshua. He's a very very slick boxer, Ukraine. Um, and so now it's a case of, well, do you think Tyson Fury can get out boxed? Uh, he's a little bit vulnerable to the body, but like Tyson Fury is not a vicious body puncher. So I definitely think he's a live dog, dude. I don't think it's a stupid thing to, to sprinkle a little something on him, uh, that night for sure. But, um, it's crazy. It is crazy because Tyson Fury, I think people looked at this guy as, you know, the, the, the standard bear, like this guy was the next great heavyweight. We know we've been waiting for it. It's been a pretty good division with Deontay and AJ, but Tyson was the man and, you know, probably the first real guy people respect because nobody really respected the Klitschko's, you know, just their reign, but their reign was boring. They were fighting in Germany at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and so now Tyson Fury like gets knocked down by an MMA fighter and it's like, it throws you for a loop. Um, so it, it's an interesting thing. So I think legacy wise, hell yeah, he wants to get that back, but does his brain? I don't know. He's made a lot of money. Usyk, maybe not the household name of all those other guys you just mentioned, Deontay Wilder, Anthony Joshua, Tyson Fury, but maybe there will be some more pay-per-view vibes or some more eyeballs on it because people go, hold on, is Tyson Fury that guy? Because I just saw him lose, in a lot of our opinion, to Francis Ngannou. Let's get back to Conor McGregor here for a second. He said, and this was actually just a couple of days ago, that he still has, quote, unfinished business versus Dustin Poirier. You're going to fight me if I say, I never want to see that fight again. I'm good. I, I I wouldn't hate it just because the rivalry is, they really, it's such a fascinating rivalry because it spans so many years. And then, like, they had they really hated each other at 145. Then they liked each other. Then they really hated each other. I it's do not a good fight, though. Dustin's still elite, very much elite. Yeah. I mean, you saw him in the BMF fight. He's very much still elite. Maybe not the very top of his game, pretty damn close. Nobody, including Connor, thinks that he is. Yeah, and I just don't think that, um, you know, it, the thing that's going to be interesting with seeing with Connor, man, and, and this has been something we've watched with him. This really doesn't even have to do with the, uh, it, it doesn't even really have to do with the injury. It's like he fought. Dustin pretty much straight up as a boxer and man when Connor was on the up and up the kicks the distance that he had with those uh, the 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 angles those were all just so important to his game and it feels like the more the older he got the more it was basically I'm just gonna bombs away and you know Dustin Borey is gonna figure that out Gaethje's gonna figure that out Last one, then we'll get out of here Colby versus Leon is it the, the pay per view of UFC 296 coming up next. I'm not sure, but you're going to fight me if I say, I think at this point, Colby is better than Usman. The only reason I say I'm not sure is the truth is, Colby doesn't fight that often. And Usman has looked okay, even in losing efforts. But you're going to fight me if I say, if they were to fight tomorrow, Colby would beat Usman. No, I can't accept that. I've seen the fight. I've seen the style of the fight. Colby's very hard to beat. But this guy, it's close, but I feel like this guy has the, he's got the key. He's got the confidence. He's got the power advantage. Um, No, I don't think Colby, I, I wouldn't bet on him. I would still bet on Usman, even with the losses. I mean, I was more impressed with Usman and the loss to, to Hamzat than I was with Hamzat. Ain't that the truth? Still on team Usman over Colby. Unbelievable. That's Brendan Tobin. I'm the sports machine, Sean Levine. Coming up next, we talk more fighting and we make more money right here. I'm tapped out.
We're back with more Tapped Out with Brendan Tobin and Sean Levine on the BetQL Network. Final segment of the show. Welcome into Tapped Out. About to wrap up Tapped Out here on the BetQL Network with Brendan Tobin. I am the sports machine, Sean Levine. Let's talk a little football for a minute. Uh, After Patrick Mahomes, who's the next best quarterback in the NFL? Corn Row Tua. Do you still believe that? Do you, do I you, do. Do you I still do believe, believe that? Okay, all right. Just making sure. Listen, dude, Wait. don't don't tell me you weren't sweating that game a little. I had some other Chiefs fans who were like, a little dicey. You guys haven't exactly been lighting the earth on fire. Okay, you know, but you, if, you I, if, if I gave you a bet right now and said mm-hmm. you can take the Chiefs or you can take any other team in the NFL, you're still taking the Chiefs, and I'll take it one step further. If I said you can have the Chiefs or you can have every other team in the NFL, the old Chiefs versus the field, take you're the field. right. You're right. You're taking the field. Who are taking you taking the field. the field? The Dolphins. Okay. See? Bro, you guys won on an illegal fumble. Like, you know, stop acting like you blew the doors off the Dolphins. Like, he, did, there was, he, he didn't even make a football move. Like, you know, can you at least, like, acknowledge, like, you got away with one? Oh, please. No. Chiefs would have. Like, I know. Listen, if it was any, if, if it was the other way around, it was the, pay, the player that I was most petty against, and he had that gap. Of course, I'd be laughing at him, but that wasn't a fumble. It was garbage. Are the uh, are the Bills going to make the playoffs? Man, what a bad loss that was to the Broncos. I think that's speaking to your division, man. I do think Miami wins the division. I think Buffalo's cooked. Yeah, they look it. I mean, firing Ken Dorsey, I think, for having 12 men on the field is crazy. Like, he's not responsible for that. So that was, I thought, a really bad look for their head coach. I think he's feeling the heat a little bit. I will say this, you know, it's interesting for the Dolphin fan down here because – everybody doesn't really know what to do with their hands. Like they haven't won a division since 2008 and it's literally like, okay, it's there for you. Raiders, jets, commanders, Titans, jets for the next five games. Go take care of you. Everybody says you can't beat a good, you can't beat a good team, but we know you handle teams. Like it's right there for them to basically have this division wrapped up because I think the Bills are taking on you guys, the Eagles, like they are going into the teeth of their schedule. So the Dolphins, it's right there for them. Like success, they they very much like two on that last snap. All you have to do is catch the snap and give yourself a chance. It's right there for you. Don't blow it because it's, there's no reason that they shouldn't go into at least into this, into the last three weeks where they got the Cowboys at Baltimore, which is their toughest game left. And then hosting the Bills. There's no reason they shouldn't go into those final weeks not having double digit wins. Love it. Brendan Tobin, Sports Machine, Sean Levine. Let's get off the football field back into the Octagon UFC 82 coming up on Saturday night. Brendan Allen, way too big of a favorite, dog. Minus 425 against Paul Craig, plus 330. Give me Bear Jew all night long. That is a big line. That is a big line for that fight. I do love Brendan Allen. Now, does he have a rat hat? Like, uh, you know, you always are very, de- you know, you you love to mock these hats. of and, and Brendan Allen, I don't know if it's like a raccoon. I don't know what he has going on there. but uh, I, I believe it is some sort of raccoon or so, something in the rodent family. Do you actually bet, though, based on hat? Like, would you take Khabib in a fight? Would you take Shavkat Rachmanov in a fight just because of their headwear? Um, possibly, definitely Rachmanov. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know. I'm looking at the props. I like Brendan Allen, KO, one, plus 125. Paul Craig did just get knocked out uh, a fight ago before he was able to uh, bounce back with his win. You know, Johnny Walker got him. I think Brendan Allen's really good. I think he's really talented. I think that he's got the whole package. Um, So, yeah, I think him by, I, I agree with you, like just taking him straight up. That's tough look, but right now. Uh, you know, these guys are both really good on the ground. That's usually the bread and butter for Brendan Allen. So now it's a case of a hands game. And I think he's got the better of that. So I'm going to go with that. What do you think about the Chase Hooper, Jordan Levitt fight right now? Chase Hooper, basically a two to one favorite at bet MGM. I'm looking at minus 225. You can get Levitt on the comeback at plus 175. Levitt, a little bit like a guy we were talking about earlier in uh flash Gordon where I mean, pretty good fighter. Yeah, pretty good fighter. Um, Chase Hooper, though. I mean, like this kid's been. I remember having Chase Hooper in studio when he was fighting for Titan FC when he was seventeen, when he was the teenage dream before he was the dream. That's right. You know, and then before he was Ben Askren's son. That's right. So I got a special place in my heart for the kid. I can't deny my bias. 
I love him on the ground, and I'm going to go with him by submission. I think he gets it done. I think he chokes out Jordan Levitt, which, which, by the way, Jordan Levitt did let people know this week, just in case you're wondering and you are going to throw your money. Apparently, his wife is due any day, and he says if she goes into labor, I just want – he's like, I, I'm warning the UFC. I am pulling out of the fight if she goes into labor, just so everybody knows. If you're going to put action on this, you might want to wait till the ring walk. I am 1 million percent hoping that that happens just to see Dana <laughs> scramble and what he does. By the way, how old do you think? So you've been a Chase Hooper guy for a long time since about when he got his driver's license. How old do you think he is now? I got it in front of me. 24? He's 24, bro. How is that possible? What in the name of Michelle Wee is going Crazy. on? Like, what? He's yeah. still only 24 years old? That's I unbelievable. Know. I know it's crazy. I mean, I remember they stuck. You remember when they like stuck him with like Alex Caceres when he was, you know, 19 years old. And I'm guy. like, I'm like, what are they doing? <laughs> this poor kid can't beat Alex Caceres. He's a child. Caceres is your guy. All right. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but just to brush over it one more time, the UFC schedule ahead of us, we've got UFC 82 in Vegas, Allen versus Craig. Austin, just a couple of weeks away on December 2nd. How do you feel about that main event? Armand Sarukian and Benil Daryush. Yeah, it's a really, really great main event. Really great card that they have in Austin. Great card. Um, That's a crazy good fight. Benil really wanted to bounce back. I feel bad about what happened to him in that last fight against Charles Oliveira. I think I'm leaning Sarukian, man. I don't know. There's just it, there's something a little bit that I, I feel like the 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 air is taken out of Benil Daryush. It felt like it was riding high there, and you know he had the injury, and then he's watching Islam go win the belt, and now he has the loss to Charles Oliveira. So I think I, I'm leaning Sarukian in that one. But that's a that's a hell of a card coming up in Austin for sure. And, of course, we'll break that one down in full in the coming weeks. And then we mentioned the next pay-per-view coming up. That is December 16th, UFC 297, Colby Covington versus Leon Edwards. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Your thoughts on that one? Because now we've been talking about that one now for a handful of months, and I haven't changed. I'm still on Colby. It's a really tough fight to pick. Um, because Colby is a much different wrestler. Like we talk about the Usman Colby matchup and it's tough not to always go with that parallel. And it looked like, I mean, like Leon's takedown defense definitely looks very much improved. Thus him having the two recent wins against Kamara Usman. Yes. One of them was kind of Usman putting it on a platter for him, but second one, he won. Um, but Colby's different. You know, Colby's got that, that, that just relentless cardio. He tries to wear you out, pick you up, put you down, put you with strikes on the way in. And so it feels almost like Leon's got to catch him with something on the coming, you know, like he's got to get him with, uh, with some kind of counter shop, something big to really make Colby uh, slow up a little bit. Cause if you don't, you're going to be pretty worn out by the time we get to, to, to round five and Colby doesn't get tired. I mean, he never gets tired. He's always always pushing the pace he's always you know making you feel like and the other thing that's sneaky about him i remember like him fighting robbie lawler back in the day and you could just see i never see robbie lawler fear anybody right, right. And i want to say he was scared of colby covington but he definitely didn't want to be knocked out by colby covington by just being worn out and tired on his feet so it felt very much like he was fighting conservative like i feel like colby can make you fight more conservative than you typically would. And I'm going to be fascinated to see what that first round looks like because I do feel like Leon has to make an impact early. And I'm going to tell you this right now, you're going to be able to get the champion at underdog money that night. Right now, Leon is a slight favorite, very slight at Bet MGM, but a lot of public money is going to come in on Colby Covington right before the fight. If you wait right until fight night, maybe right before the walk, I think if you want Leon Edwards, you're going to get him at like plus 130 by the time that fight goes off. But we've still got a few weeks away for that one. And of course, we'll be here to break it down for my producer, Jake Noaker, and my co-host, Brendan Tobin. I'm the sports machine, Sean Levine, and we'll talk to you right here next week on Tapped Out.